for the song we're leading this morning. We thank God for Brother Jackson, Brother Robinson, the great scripture reading by Brother Stephen. So we thank God for every true believer who is here this morning to worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible says God seeking such to worship him. So we thank God for your presence this morning. And in particular, we want to acknowledge those who are here for the first time. Do we have any first-time visitors? If you're here for the first time, we want to greet you and make sure that we, we say hello to you and shake your hand. If you're here for the first time, would you please stand? All right. No first-time visitors, praise God. We're all home folks. I mean, we can let our dirty laundry out, amen? <laughs> praise God. Sometimes when you have visitors, you can't say what you want to say. Now that I have the cue, I'm okay, all right. Praise God. We thank you, nevertheless, we thank God for all our regulars. We know that uh, the East Point Church of Christ is a loving body because of you. We want to thank God uh, for all the love that you demonstrated last week. Uh, I personally want to thank each and every one of you, those who were able to come and those who were not able to thank God for you and your prayers and your spirit. We also would like to thank those who prepared uh, the fine dinner that we had. Uh, it was from delicious. We thank all the sisters uh, who worked so ardently and labored so hard in the kitchen, and not just the ones that prepared the food, the ones that served it. Amen. 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 You know, you, you got to cook, but you got to have a waiter too. Amen. And so we thank God for all your, your diligence and for your love, because it takes love to do that type of thing. People don't, don't do things for you unless they love you. So we thank God for having a great congregation that's just a loving congregation. Um, we thank God for you, uh, one and all. We want to uh, also uh, thank God for blessing some of our sick and shedding members here. We have some people that are going through some, uh, some surgeries or who have just come out of surgery. I see Sister Baker is here. Amen. Amen. And we can help her. Amen. Amen. She probably should be at home, but you know, can't use this great now. So we want to make sure we pray for her that she doesn't overextend herself, as well as others who are sick and shutting. Let's keep all our sick and shutting members in prayer. Amen. Now, if you would, would you please turn to the book of Philippians and the Bible, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This month, we have designated as the month on which we will speak from the dramatic thrust. Christian graces. Christian graces. This whole month of June, we'll be talking about Christian graces. So when you come, uh, we're going to examine the, 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 what the Bible says about Christian graces. When we talk about uh, Christian graces, I, 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 I get a warm feeling inside because Christian graces means something that I didn't earn. Let me back and say that again because I didn't give a response. Christian grace is something that I didn't earn. Uh, God's desire for his children is to have total reliance and assurance on him. There are certain foundational concepts in the Bible that one should never forget. We should remember them as dearly as our birthdays are, perhaps as our anniversaries when it comes to marriages. Uh, we should remember that these things should stay in the forefront of our collective hearts and minds. We should keep them ever before us as landmarks and reminders. One of these Christian graces uh, is one called mercy. Mercy has many technical definitions, but perhaps the most succinct and pointed one is mercy is God holding back from us what we deserve. If you ever hear the word mercy, I want you to understand what it literally means. It is God who is infinitely just, who has all the right to punish us anytime he so pleases. We are breathing his air as corruptible beings, but God held back from us and is still holding back from us that which we deserve. Now, mercy has a sibling. It's actually a twin named Grace. 
Grace is the twin brother of mercy. So where you see one, you usually see the other. Amen. However, grace is defined in many ways in theological circles and in academia. But the simplest definition, one that states it perfectly, is grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. Grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. Brothers and sisters, for a few moments that I have remaining, I want to talk from three points and less will be yours. The first point is the unsurpassed quality of peace. The unsurpassed quality of peace. The next thing I want to talk about is the unrelenting power of peace. The unrelenting power of peace. And then lastly, I want to deal with the unbelievable provisions of peace. The unbelievable provisions of peace. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1, says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, yes, and beseech sympathy, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also through your fellow. Help those women which labor with me in the gospel with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Verse number seven is where we're going to camp out this morning. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, for just a few moments, I want to talk about the peace of God. The peace of God. Verse number seven says, the peace has to first come from a source other than yourself. If you see the, the genitive, even though it's not in the, the original text, the term is just peace God, or, or Irene Theos. But there is a certain implication there. It is the peace of God. God gives us this peace. It indicates that there is a place from which it must come, spiritually, not naturally. This peace is superior to any carnal attempts. Peace is defined as to join or to bind together which was broken or divided. It means to set it one again. You've heard it expressed this way. They have it all together. So when we think of peace, I want us to launch from that definition because peace does not mean the absence uh, of problems or the absence of tribulation. The word peace literally means to set together. It means to, to bring back together. Now, brothers and sisters, why is that important? Because this peace is superior to any carnal attempts. The unrelenting power of peace. This peace is not temporal for the child of God because it says it shall keep your hearts and mind. Too many Christians have voluntarily relinquished their God-given peace. And the peace of God is not absence of problems, but a reflection of the presence of the divine sufficiency in the midst of the problems. For note-taking, I want you to write down Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 and verse number 19. 
So we understand because of the unsurpassed quality of peace that we then have the unbelievable provision of peace. In Isaiah chapter 26 and verse number 3, Isaiah 26 and verse number 3, the Bible says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Now understand what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah says, God will keep your mind in perfect peace. The word there, peace, comes from a term in the Hebrew that is very interesting because it, it literally talks about tranquility, but it also says that God will keep it. God will guard it in your heart. But how does he do that? He does it continually because you have kept your mind stained on the Lord. Now, it's important to understand the prerequisites to having the peace of God. You first have to understand who has the peace, which is God. God has the peace. But he says in order to receive the peace, you must have your mind stayed on him. Now, brothers and sisters, that's going to be a hard part for most of us because when we have problems, the first thing we want to do is try to solve them. The first thing we want to do is try to find a solution in our minds, in our carnal minds, of how do I rectify the situation. You know, in this world, there are so many things that are going on, it can disturb the peace, can't it? Just the other week, there was a young lady whose body was riddled with bullets about three miles west of here. Her body was dumped in a park. Her mother, her grandmother could not figure out why she was killed in such a gruesome way. About three weeks ago, a young man was driving in the city of East Point. Three or four of them were in a van and they came up a hill. And on top of the hill, there was a young man with an AK-47 randomly shooting at this car. He kills one of the occupants. And the question is, in this political climate, we have candidates that, that like to be divisive, and, and they talk about one group to stir them up against another group. They have people that have lied and have done all these types of things in the political arena, and we wonder who to vote for. We don't know. As a child of God, sometimes it gets sort of ambiguous because they, they don't seem to have the character or the integrity that we, we need for a president. But the question is, how do we find peace? People are losing jobs. And those of us who have jobs are stressed out because we have evil supervisors. We have clicks on our jobs. We have people that don't like us, not because of what we've done, simply because we don't uh, promote all types of foolishness. Where do you find peace in a world like that? The Lord says, I have the peace. Brothers and sisters, let's understand where this peace comes from. The Lord says, you can have it if you keep your mind stayed on me. In the Hebrew, that word there, stay, means to rest upon. It means to sustain. It means to be refreshed. It pictures, if you will, someone leaning against the wall who has no more strength. They walk as far as they can walk, and so they lean against a tree or they lean against the wall for support. God says, lean upon me, and I will give you perfect peace. First Peter chapter 5, around verse 6 and 7, the Bible teaches us that, that we should cast all our cares upon the Lord, for he careth for us. Brothers and sisters, one must come to know God first before experiencing the peace of God. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. Turn there quickly. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Every believer has to come into the eternal peace with God. He says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. However, not every believer necessarily experiences the peace 
of God, which Paul describes in this passage. This peace is a promise which is the result of the practice of thankful prayer to God. Before God saves us, we are at war with the Almighty, and our peace with Him is disturbed. When we are justified by faith and reconciled to our Creator by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are made positionally at peace with God and are set at one again. So to speak like Adam and Eve when they were in the Garden of Eden and sin entered into the world, Paul says, I can give you peace of God, which can be a believer's experience. It's what's called experiential peace. As one uh, who surrenders their will to God, he submits his, uh, to his authority and he walks in a spiritual empowered direction and obedience. This is what is meant by the fact that you can have peace of God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 15. Colossians 3 and verse number 15, the Bible says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. God says, I'm going to give you peace. But the peace I'm going to give you must have rule in your heart. It's interesting as we, we look at this analogy, Paul uses what's called a sporting analogy. Paul says, let the peace of God umpire in your life. See, sometimes we want God's peace, but we don't want God's peace to do what it's supposed to do. When you're wrong, guess what he says? Strike one. When you're not doing what's right, God says strike two. And when you keep on doing it, God says you're out. Because God's peace rules in our lives. I wish I had one or two Bible readings this morning. And so what we have to understand, brothers and sisters, is that God's peace must rule. The peace of God is one test of whether or not we are in the will of God. He says, let this peace that Christ can give you keep on acting as an umpire in your hearts. If we are walking with the Lord, if we yield into the Spirit, then the peace of God and the God of peace exercises the influence over our lives and our hearts. Whenever we disobey, we lose that peace. And we know we are not His because we are not doing His will. But understand this also, brothers and sisters. The peace comes from reconciliation. Reconciliation is an interesting term because it means to bring two parties that were once uh, at odds together. It is the state of mind which has reconciliation for its basis. The peace is but another word for joy. For it is beyond the reach of disturbance. Come what will, it cannot injure. Come when it likes, it is welcome. And come as it may, it is a blessing in disguise. The peace is not indigenous, it is the peace of God. In other words, you don't have it within yourself. God must give you this type of peace. And it's interesting, some of us, we, we can't find it even as a child, a child of God because we're looking in the wrong place. Some of us are looking for peace in our relationships. And that's why we have other relationships. And that's why we have, uh, if we're not married, we have these multiple relationships. Some of us who aren't married may, may, may have some multiple relationships. That's why you can never get enough money. You leave one job and you're making X amount of dollars here. But then you, you say, I get tired of this because I need more money to be happy. And you go, you work another job. And then you, you got four or five jobs, but you find yourself still without peace. You know why? Because it's not within yourself that you can find peace. It's within God only. True peace only comes from the word of the Lord. John chapter 14 and verse 27. John chapter 14 and verse 27. Look at what the apostle John says. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth it, I give unto you. He says, let your heart not be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. In other words, John is trying to tell us that there is something about God's peace that will bring you above all the fracas and all the fray. 
The word of God will bless us in such a manner that no matter what we're going through, brothers and sisters, we can come out on time. Now let's look at verse 27, and let's, let's, let's look at it and investigate what does John really mean. He says, the peace I leave with you. Interesting term, because when he says, I leave with you, it, it's a word in the Greek that literally means, I, I have a companion. This is a person or a thing that's been with me. But as I leave you now, the companion that was by my side, he's going to stay and I'm going to go. Do you see that? See, see, if you really feel this sermon, you somebody say amen to that. See, see, when, when the Lord left, the disciples got depressed. They started crying, but Jesus said, no, I'm going to leave something with you. I'm going to leave the Holy Ghost with you. He's going to be your comforter. He's going to be your paraclete. But the Lord says, I leave this peace with you. And then he says, now it's not just any old peace. It's no peace you can go to Walmart and get. He said, no peace you're going to find a bottle of Johnny Walker Red. This, monk, little boy. this is not the kind of peace you're going to find in the middle of Praise God. This is not the kind of peace you're going to find at 2 a.m. under the sheets. This type of peace is the only thing I can give to you. You can't buy this kind of peace. You can't work this kind of peace. You can't earn this kind of peace. God says, I'm going to give you this peace. He's my peace. And then look what he says. He says, I give it unto you, not as the world giveth. Understand, brothers and sisters, the world has peace. The world has peace. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. We have peace out here in the world. Some things that you can do that you can get temporary peace. Promotion can give you temporary peace. Praise God. You're happy for about a day or two, maybe a week, maybe a month. And then the pressures of that new promotion start to turn you back. And you start saying, man, I should have stayed in my old position. These folks are crazy. I see why they, they leave it early. They're retiring now because that, 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 that promotion, although it was nice for a little while, it's only temporal peace. It's only temporal peace. But the Lord says, uh, the one that I'm going to give you, it's going to last. And then watch this. He says, not as the world give it. He says, give I unto you. He says, I did on me. He says, I bestow it as a gift. You know, sometimes we receive some things that we don't really want. But when the Lord says, I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to give it as a gift, you better take it. Amen. Praise God. And God says, I'm going to leave this, and I'm going to give it to you. And watch this, brothers and sisters. He says, uh, if, 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 in verse number 27, he says, and the world can't give it to you, but I'm going to give it to you. And he says, let your heart not be troubled. Do you see that? Yes, now, now, that term trouble is a Greek term that literally means don't let your heart be agitated. Don't let your soul be troubled, perplexed, disturbed. In other words, when I leave this peace, the peace is in the passive voice there. It literally means that this is something that's going to overwhelm you. There's nothing you can do about this piece I'm going to give it to you because I'm going to give it to you and now your mind is going to take hold of it. See, when your mind takes hold, no longer do you have to worry about what the doctor said. See, the six-month diagnosis doesn't mean anything to you anymore when you got God's peace. The foreclosure notice on your house, it doesn't really bother you anymore when you got God's peace. That, that child that won't obey you, it does not bother you as much because now you've got God's peace. Does not mean that that child will stop uh, acting crazy. Doesn't mean that the foreclosure won't go through. Doesn't mean that when you press Tilly, she says you only have $105 in your hand. Do they still have Tilly's praise God? I don't know. But whatever it is in your life, God says you've got peace now. We've got peace. You know, it reminds me of a painting. Uh, there was a bird on the limb. And in the background, you saw lightning and clouds. It looked like a tornado and a storm raging. And, and the artist uh, would ask, why did you draw a, a bird on a limb uh, with the storm and the lightning in the background? That does not look like peace to me. I, 
I see pieces being a, a, a stream flowing with the sun and the birds chirping and the butterflies flying around. And he says, you know, uh, peace is not the absence of problems. He says, you can have problems, but you can have peace when you have God. Brothers and sisters, that's why we ought to look at life. We are never going to get problems. Life is going to come to us all types of ways, and we're not going to be ready for it. But that does not mean that we, we have to walk around depressed. That doesn't mean we have to walk around disturbed, wondering what's going to happen next, when's the other shoe going to fall? Because God says when you have peace with him, you can have peace of him. I wish someone understood that this morning. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Then he uses an absolute negation. He says, neither in the Greek. Ooh. He says, absolutely, positively, don't let nothing trouble you. He says, but neither let it be afraid. Now, I figured if I'm not troubled, then I'm not afraid. But he says, no, it's two different things. He says, don't let your soul be troubled so that your external won't be afraid. One is passive in the voice, and it's an imperative, so that means it's a command. And the other is active. See, when you can know you have the peace of God, then you can act like you ain't got no problems. <laughs> when God is your God, when you know God controls all things, then you won't have to worry about anything. That's what he actually meant in one verse up. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, be anxious for nothing. Be careful for nothing. But in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. 